Hello everyone and welcome to this month's episode of In the Community. I'm Jennifer Beck. This month we bring you two survivor testimonies, but their stories are not the same. Daryl Kraft survived six strokes in a 15 month period of time. His survivor story involves physical health. Jody Holtzberry, meanwhile, launched into the music world as a country artist. But then God grabbed her heart and started to heal her in places she didn't know needed to be healed. Her survivor story involves emotional health and spiritual health. Both will tell you that God is the answer to every difficult situation. Let's start with my conversation with Jody Holtzberry. And here she is, Jody Holtzberry is with me, and we've had her here before. And if you know anything about remnant worship, then you have experienced the worship uh, worship experience that comes with Jody and her sister and the band and all those things. But we're going to dive back several years back, and I'm going to bring up a name that we don't hear much anymore. Polly May. <laughs> That's how I first knew of you. Polly May. This is before your worship time. Yes. So talk to me about that life. That life. Oh my gosh. It's been a while, but it was a very self-driven, um, just a, a journey of trying to find self-success. Um, I really loved country music. Polly May was named after our dear grandmother. Mm. And um, me and my sister were just touring and traveling around the nation and just trying to make a name for ourselves, really. Um, it was it was fun for a season, <laughs> but um, I just wasn't following the Lord at the time. I was following my own dreams, following mm -hmm. my own passions, really, um, in a selfish way. To be honest with you, now that I look back, and that's been that's been gosh, I think it's been six or seven years ago that I've last get, gave that dream up completely. Um, but it was like pulling the fingers away from it when the Lord um, really wrecked my life, and I really found who Jesus was, and He just turned my life around. Mm -hmm. And as He talked with me and as I grew to know him and as our relationship started to bud, I started to really not want that any longer mm -hmm. when I really thought that's what I wanted. But if you go back to those days, it was singing in bars, it was in honky tonks, um, it was traveling, drinking was heavily involved, um, nightlife, weekends, um, and so it was really rough on my body as well mm -hmm. and on my voice. Um, but at the time, that's what I thought that I wanted. That's, that was everybody's, every singer's dream, especially mm -hmm. living in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Everybody in Nashville is a singer. Everybody's trying to make it. And that's what I was doing. I was just on that path to try to make a name for myself and make it um, in, the, in the music industry. And so it really became a self-destructive path, to be honest with you. Um, but I, I was so blind at that time in my life. Mm -hmm. I just thought, this is what I want. This is what I need. And I was very, very driven in it. Um, and then I went to Nashville to pursue country music. At, I think I was 40 years old. I mean, I'd been doing this for like 15 years prior to that. Mm -hmm. And I started going to church down there, which was a miracle. I can remember my mom calling me and is like, are you okay? <laughs> and I was volunteering at church and um, it, something was different in that church. There was an anointing there and the pastors, Alex and Henry Seeley of the Belonging Co. just spoke to my heart. Mm -hmm. And I can remember meeting Jesus in my apartment. I was just laying on the floor bawling because I was, this internal struggle was taking place. I was like, but these are my dreams. This mm -hmm. is what I want. Why would you want me to give all this up, you know? And he said to me, he said, will you give me everything? Mm -hmm. Will you give it all to me? And to be honest with you, I made the decision to follow Jesus in that moment but I wasn't completely surrendered. Mm. It was about two years. I still was trying to, I was trying to mix it into, I was trying to mix him into my life rather than me fitting into his plan mm. for my life. And in that moment, um, I just said no, to be honest, and I still tried to mix it. But then it finally came to a point where I could feel like this isn't satisfying me anymore. Um, this is tiring me out. And I can remember standing on stage at times and just looking over crowds and just thinking, wow, this is not where I want to be. This is not satisfying me any longer. But it really was like this, this draw and pull type of situation where Jesus was drawing me closer to him and it was pulling me away from those things. And it was a gradual process. It wasn't something that happened overnight for me. And I know there's some people that have that experience, but for me, it just was like he was trying to process 
pride out of me, mm. self-success, self-promotion. Um, and it was a really raw stripping that I had to go through with him. And I look back on it and I'm so thankful. Yeah. I'm so thankful. <laughs> but at the time I can remember crying and doors were closing and he was like, you know, we're done here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I mean, I was just kicking and screaming the whole way through it. But it took a moment for me to just say, okay, I am going to give you back my dreams and my plan and I'm gonna let your will be done in my life. And that's when everything completely turned around. <laughs> you know, something that we hear so often, just we as people on this earth, follow your dreams. Mm -hmm. We hear that a lot, follow your dreams. You can do anything you put your mind to. So you are talented as a singer. We know God gave you that talent, mm -hmm. but not everybody gives God the glory. You're talented as a singer. You had the right smarts to, to get yourself going. You were finding success in the country music business. You say you toured nas nationwide. Yeah. I mean, that's exciting. Yeah. You stood on stages, you sang for groups, you were rising in success, but yet something was not the success that you knew was needed inside of your soul. Yeah, and, it, and he knew that, but I didn't. But the closer I got to him, the more I was realizing like, this is not satisfying me any longer. And then my eyes just began to open. I started to see myself as a puppet on a string. Wow. It was so incredible yeah. because then all of a sudden I was like, whoa, it was like he gave me the perspective. And I didn't trust him at that time because I thought, mm -hmm. why would you ask me to give this up when I've worked so hard mm -hmm. for all of this? And at a moment that I felt like this is probably where it's gonna break through. You know, they say there's like this 10 year, like, Thing in Nashville after you're there 10 years you know that's when it hits and it had been around the 10 11 year mark that I had been pursuing country music and at that moment it was like he asked me to completely sacrifice mm -hmm. it all but I look back and I'm so thankful because he knew better yeah. he he where I'm at now in my life is so much more satisfying mm -hmm. it actually has nothing to do with me yes he gave me gifts he gave me talents but now he's using them all for his glory and now that I have the relationship that I do with Jesus, that's all I want. That's all I want is for his name to be famous. That's all I want is for him to get all of the glory. And there's really, when you get to that point where he strips you down, there's really nothing of you left. It's like that Jody's dead completely. And the test of that has been moments where there's been opportunities that have come back up. Um, there's been memories on Facebook where somebody will share a video and there was a season where that would kind of still pull on me because mm -hmm. the enemy has a amazing way, I shouldn't say amazing, that's more positive, but he has a way of really glamorizing your old life mm -hmm. and making you think it was more fun then. Mm -hmm. you, you missed out, you're missing out on more, but the, the truth, that's not true, that's a lie. It's and temporary fun. It is. It's fun for just and a And it moment. was temporary, yeah. it, temporary fun, but long-term, permanently, my voice was being destroyed, the alcohol, the late nights, the decisions I was making, and really, in all reality, when you sign to a label, when you're going down that path, they own you. Mm -hmm. You become a slave to a record label. You become a slave to the industry. You become a slave to people. And you know, when I made the decision to completely get out, it was pretty drastic because I knew the Lord was asking me, like, be done. And I had a year full of bookings. Mm -hmm. And I had to call everybody up and tell them, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And the backlash was so surprising. And that's when it really opened my eyes mm. that these people don't truly care about your well-being or your best interest. And I'm not saying I didn't have wonderful fans because I did, but at the end of the day, it was about entertaining them. Mm. It was about making them happy. And the Lord really showed me like, you've been a puppet on a string for a long time and I'm cutting those strings and you're gonna be a slave to me and it's gonna be amazing, and it's gonna be more than you ever could imagine. And you know what's beautiful? As I passed my dreams completely back to him, there was a season where I felt like I have no dreams. I'm just gonna to submit to you. But then he turned around and he gave me more than I even thought I ever wanted. <laughs> and he gave me the desires of my heart, and now the desires of my heart match his heart. And I love to travel, I get to travel. I love to sing, I get to sing. But there was more that he wanted me to do and there was more inside of me that I felt like he excavated the gold on the inside of me that I didn't even know I had. And 
that would be like my biggest word of encouragement to anybody. Just take your dreams and put them on the altar. Give them back to him. It's hard though. It is so hard. It's, that's it's not scary. easy. It is scary. And, that's a, and I, as I say that, I realize that's me in my flesh wanting to hold on. Like you said, you had a year's worth of bookings. Hold on to what you had built and you literally put all of that on the altar and gave it to God and trusted him with no idea what the future, you didn't end that knowing that remnant worship was going to start to do all the things that it did. You no, didn't know that at the time. I had no idea. Um, matter of fact, I don't even think remnant had been put on my heart yet at the mm -hmm. time. Um, I had this idea, you know, how we do, we think the things out our way that he was going to incorporate Jesus into the bars or he mm. was going to incorporate himself into my life. And so I was still trying to make that happen. And, you know, the reason he pulled me out is because there was things that he still had to pull out of me. Mm. Being in those atmospheres, being mm. around certain people, I was still looking back on it. I was still susceptible to going back to that old lifestyle because there were some things that he just wasn't finished with me yet. So he had to really just completely rip me out of that complete scene altogether. And it felt like isolation. It was a wilderness mm -hmm. because I'm like, this is all I've known. This is all I've known. The people, how to talk, how to look, how to act, how to sing, what to sing. And then it was just like he completely eradicated it all. But he had to. It's like he just had to start from the ground up for me. Mm -hmm. Let's go back down to the foundation of who you are and what I've made you. And it started in my living room. I said, who am I? Mm -hmm. And he just started to build on that. And that was, I want to say that's been 15, well, I guess not 15 years ago. It would been like maybe seven or eight years ago that I was sitting in my living room. And I said, who am I? Who did you make me to be? And it started with just one scripture. And from that point to now, I've learned so much. It wasn't in an instant. It's taken some years for me to learn who he's made me to be. And I'm still learning, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> but it's been such a beautiful process. It really has. And I'm so thankful. So, so now catch us up with where you are now and what's happening now. Our viewers at home, our viewers watching, have only seen the remnant worship side. They probably didn't see that side you just shared. Um, some of them may have had, but didn't know all the stories of where it went. Your obedience to go through that wilderness and then for God to give you back your dreams in a sense with a new vision, yes. a new thing. And that's where you are now. That's where I am now. It's overwhelming, to be honest with you. Even when he told me, um, I want you to be a mobile worship. And I was like, ooh, this is exciting, you yeah. know, because I get to travel, which is what I love to do. And I love to sing. And so I started there. It was just like one step of obedience. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, so that's where I started. And that began to build. And um, next thing I know, we find ourselves doing worship in a bar, which mm -hmm. was incredible. But he took me back to the very place that I used to kind of worship and I used in, in a bad way, yeah. right? And there he takes me right back to that place and he allows me to give him glory. He reclaimed it for he, his he, glory. Yes, yes. And that was just for a small season, but it was so powerful mm -hmm. because I had really realized in that moment I had overcame so much mm. alcoholism mm. and the whole lifestyle yeah. because I walked in and there wasn't anything pulling on me anymore. And I was like, wow, I've really overcome this. It's, it's so beautiful. Yeah. And then we went down to the square in Lima, Ohio, and we started singing down there because he told me to. And we just pulled this little PA system down there and I just started singing. And next thing I know, a year and a half later, we're feeding the homeless. Yeah. People's lives are being changed that never would have walked into church. And I realized that he was starting to show me what his full, fuller plan was for me. And then fast forward a few years after that, and then it's prophetically spoken that there's going to be a house of prayer and worship 24 seven in Lima. And I can remember thinking, that's not me. Like, I just, I just want to travel and worship. I don't <laughs> want to do anything like that. And again, it was an act of obedience. It's like, do you trust me? It was overwhelming for me because I didn't even think I had that in me to begin that or administrate that. It just, I just thought, God, why me? There were so many times I laid on the floor in my bedroom and I cried. I'm like, why did you ask me to do this? This just seems so out of my league and so out of what I know 
I can do, but he knew better. He always does. It's amazing. <laughs> but you know, he really will ask you to do things that require so less of you uh. so you can lean on him. And that's what he did. It was like, this really actually, you're just a vessel, but this has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. This is about me. I just need you to be obedient. That yeah. really was the key word in the last seven years of my life. Be obedient. Be obedient. Step yeah. out. Just do what I ask you to do one step at a time mm -hmm. and I'll lead you and I'll guide you. And now it was been two weeks ago. We had our first opening day for the house of prayer in Lyme, Ohio in downtown. And it has truly been not only a house of prayer, it's been a house of deliverance, a house of healing, a house of worship. Uh, it's all the things that I have seen happen in that one little tiny space in the 311 building downtown has been incredible. And it walked me back into his glory again it walked me back into i just need you to be obedient so that i can get the glory so i can get my name be made famous that's such an important lesson for all of us regardless of where we are in life obedience being obedient to what is god's asking us to do without knowing what the future is going to be yes just obedient to the next step we are almost out of time unfortunately but i know Remnant Worship is still, you know, leading worship many places. So yes. people can go on Facebook and they can find information about your events. But let's talk about this house of prayer for our final minute that we have here, because sure. that is the newest thing <laughs> that is, I see, I feel like I see what could happen downtown because of that. And that's so neat to see that's happening. How does that even work? How do people get involved in that? What do they do? Yeah, so on our Remnant page and on the House of Prayer Lima page on Facebook, you can find out how you can volunteer. Um, we're just asking people to come in and not only host there, but also sign up to volunteer to pray. The goal is to have Lima covered 24-7 mm -hmm. in prayer. And so it's a beautiful place that we have just really stewarded the presence of God there where you can come and you can pray for as long or little as you like. You don't have to sign up, but if you go there, you can see our opening hours that we have right now. They're kind of restricted or limited. We don't have a full staff yet, mm -hmm. but once we do, it will be open 24-7. And so it's just a place for people to come and add their prayers and be in agreement mm -hmm. uh, to what he is going to do in Lima, Ohio. Very Great. exciting. <laughs> oh, exciting. Jody Holtzberry, we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, but you can, of course, find out more information on those Facebook pages. Um, all that information, you see it right here on the screen. You can also always call me at the TV station, and I will get you connected with her so that you can find out more information. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, a blessing. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just so grateful you went to that church in Nashville. And you got on your floor in your apartment and you said yes to God. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> Jumping now to our next testimony. I know so many of you can identify with ongoing health challenges. I can as well. Well, allow Daryl Kraft to encourage you to continually keep your eyes on Jesus. Daryl Kraft is well known throughout this area, but did you know he is also an author, the author of The Journal of a Six-Time Stroke Survivor, and judging by the title here that tells you he has been through a lot in just a few years. Daryl is with me today to tell the story, yes. six time strokes, six strokes yeah. in a short period of time. Let's yeah. talk about what you have gone through. It's, I think um, I had the first four strokes in probably like three months and then the total in 15 months. So, and four of them were major and one was moderate and one was very minor. Yeah, so 15 months. And uh, if you can, for the people at home who we always hear about stroke symptoms, how did you know you were having a stroke at the beginning? Well, the first one I really didn't. I knew I wasn't feeling good. And, I went to the hospital and they missed it somehow. I guess they didn't do all the tests they could have done. But the second one, I ha actually had the day after my birthday, I was at work and um, I noticed trying to write in my log, I could no longer write. So, hmm. I so you knew something, something was not was right. Wrong. Yeah. 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 So did you go to the hospital then at that point yeah. too? Yeah. My... Super well. When I went down to tell my supervisor, I was like bouncing from wall to wall ah. trying to stay up. So he had someone drive my car home and told me to take a few days off and recommend that I go to the hospital again. And my my wife was working, so my dad took me. Hmm. 
Wow, so that was stroke number two yeah. in just a short period of time. Yeah. And they sent me to Toledo after that one. All right, so let's talk about Toledo. In this book, The Journal of a Six-Time Stroke Survivor, Daryl goes through basically everything that happened from stroke one all the way to stroke six and all of the other things that took place. But Toledo was a place that you were sent basically as a rehab type thing, and you were there for quite a while, weren't you? Um, it was um, several several weeks. I don't remember what I put in the book, but um, that's um, Mercy Hospitals. That's where their Stroke Central used to be, I guess, the main doctors. Um, I guess they've really built, the, um, built up a little bit in Lima, but they sent me up there for a diagnosis and mm -hmm. figure out um, figuring out all the things that were going with it and all the little all the little things mm -hmm. I need to start dealing with. So as, as I'm talking with you and people at home are watching, they might think, okay, he went through a few strokes, but he's looking pretty good now and he's doing well. But as I read this book, I realized there were some pretty dark moments. Yeah. Some really difficult moments, especially when you're up in Toledo. Yeah, I remember after stroke two, listening to some music on the TV, because that's all, I, that is all I could do. And I thought that was the best I was ever going to get. So it was a very long road back. Let's but, talk about your vision situation yeah. that you had when you were there, because you really had a lot of vision problems. Yeah, and I still do. Um, I have two separate cases of double vision, and they can't make bifocals out of um, prism glasses. So they've, the VA has basically given me two pairs and this is the long distance one for driving and the shorter distance is anything under three feet. Hmm. And I volunteer a lot, so I inventory at the soup kitchen and I have to wear those. I just keep switching glasses as I need them. Wow, wow. Yeah. So as we're talking and you know, I, I feel like it's the Paul Harvey end of the story because we get to see that here you are. Yeah. But when you were up in Toledo and you couldn't see and you didn't know what was gonna happen, you didn't know if you were ever gonna come back. No, I didn't. <laughs> And there was, I think this, like the second week I was there, we had the real bad um, blizzard and uh, wind ch temperatures dropped into the um, 50 below zero for the wind chills and no one could get up here. Mm -hmm. And that made it very difficult, so. So you were stuck there in a hospital room yeah. and not really knowing what the future held for you, yeah. but you have a faith in God. Yes. Uh -huh. How was that faith in God so important to get you through that difficult dark time? That was, it was absolutely vital because I mean, God was the only one left th mm. there. So I, I be, think I, my faith really grew during that period, mm -hmm. yeah. And isn't that interesting how God allows us to go through such yeah. difficult times? Oh yeah. And through that, his, mm -hmm. you know, it can grow our faith so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that was just the beginning though. You had more strokes that were gonna come as this 15 month time happened. So yes, uh -huh. you, you recover, you get back home, but then you had strokes, more strokes. Yeah, that, I had three and four a few weeks later. And then I think I went six or seven months before I had s stroke five and then probably another, uh, another five or six months and mm. had stroke six, so. How did you even stay mentally positive? I mean, after the sixth stroke, you, you're, you've you been through so much, you didn't even know if you're gonna stay alive. And here again, uh, sometimes people just wanna give up. They said, this is just not getting better. You didn't give up, but yet you continued to have all of these medical issues. I think just, um, praying about it. I expected I would, I, I expected I was going to die, but um, I d just prayed about it and did a lot on my phone, read up. Well, I couldn't read very well, but um, I learned, um, I use a Bible on audio now. Mm. So um, I think somewhere in there, I went for a f uh, few months not reading my Bible, but then um, I don't remember the, how I realized you, got to, you can get a Bible on yeah. audio, but I, I've been through that three or four, a few times since then. Yeah, 
Yeah. So there's no excuse for anyone yeah, to not be ingesting the Bible. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So let's shift now and talk about the book. Okay. Um, it's called again, The Journal of a Six-Time Stroke Survivor for sale in 44 countries. Is that what you said, Daryl? Yes, 44 uh -huh. countries. And we also uh, can connect with you and how that you can get your own copy of this. What led you to uh, publish the book? Well, after about stroke four, um, they put me on disability and I found how much, I asked how much my wife would get if something happened to me. Mm. And they said the payments would stop and she would get the balance of what's ever in my public employee's retirement. Mm. So I was just praying fervently, how can I raise more money mm. on another pension or whatever? And the answer was write a book. So I'm thinking, well, I, or saying, praying, um, I'm on my deathbed, how am I gonna do that? And it's write a book. You're not, she, it's not gonna make you're not going to be rich, but all the bills will be paid. So um, I said, okay, I'm going to need lots of help. So there were, I didn't have many of the memories. I need nothing, no framework to tie any mm. memories to. Mm -hmm. So I ended up reviewing over a thousand pages of medical records. Wow. So wow. I built up a timeline and then kind of just tied what memories I had in there. and got a lot of information out of the um, medical records to put in there also. So, Well, one of the things I really liked about this book is you, you did what you just mentioned. You got a lot of information from the medical records. So it's an opportunity to, to, to follow that medical journey. Yeah. But through it, you, you continually show how God was with you mm -hmm. in the high points and the low points, was there with your wife, was there yeah. with your family, was there with you in the hospital room, how God never left you throughout all of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I remember once, right after I learned to walk again, I just felt like I, God was taking a walk with me. So it's like <laughs> walking hand in hand with him for my, um, the miles I walked that day. And now you're walking a lot. Yeah. Tell I me about how things are now for you. I think in 2019, on Mother's Day actually, I walked a mile in my hallway using a cane um, quickly figured out that was going to get boring. My wife didn't want me really walking on the road because I might get, it was a pretty busy road. Mm -hmm. Now our neighbors have, they have a very long lane. So made out concrete on their land, it's off the highway. So they let me walk on that. So I think I go eight, eight round trips per mile. So. I just, I can, there's trees along the lane, it's nice and shady and it's off the highway so no one can bother mm. me, so. So for those of you at home who have suffered through a lot of medical conditions, right now I want you to keep going. You're here for a reason. God still has you on this earth for a reason. Could have taken you out, could have, could have said, okay, your time on earth is done, but didn't. And I want you to look at Daryl and use him as an inspiration for you because you're now walking you yeah. are volunteering, mm -hmm. you are riding your bike. Yes, You're doing uh -huh. things again that you probably never thought you'd do again. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't even know I could like my bike. I did, took it over to um, the one place we usually ride. I didn't even know if I was gonna be able to balance it. So, but I, you'd be surprised how much you can do if you just keep going, just don't give up. There we go. Keep going, don't give up. And we're going to end yeah. it on that note. The information is on the screen for how you can purchase your own copy of this book. You can also call me here at the TV station. And I'll make sure I get you connected properly as well, how you can get your own book. Daryl, thank you so much for sharing okay, your testimony, you. for trusting in God through the difficult times. Yep. It's so great to see where you are now. Yes. All right. Thanks for being here. Okay. Thank you. And that wraps it up for this month's episode of In the Community with myself, Jennifer Beck. If you'd like to financially support productions just like this one, please give us a call at 419-339-4444 or donate online at wtlw.com forward slash donate. Well, thanks again for watching and we'll see you again very soon.